Kate Mila Fall, Sheriff Goler, Goody and Coval Shah. You are all very welcome to our Estonia Ireland Meet the Experts Conference. We are very honoured to have with us here today experts in the field of Estonia. We hope that you take the opportunity to view the new Estonia research website and learn more about the ongoing Estonia Ireland research work. So in these slides, I, the most frequent dystonia, actually, they are dystonia that we see after a stroke, dystonia after uh, uh, some in neurodegenerative disorder, um, and other types of dystonia, cerebral palsy. So I put together the number, you can see the number of patients published, they're not huge. This is a form of myoclonic dystonia, 15 cases. This is tardive dystonia, when you take a medication for depression uh, or this psychosis, they can induce uh, some dystonia, this is uh, called a tardive dystonia. This is some neurodegenerative dystonia, and this is cerebral palsy. So these are the percentage of improvement. So you can see that myoclonic dystonia, which is the genetic form, Tardive dystonia, they improve quite nicely. A little less than neurodegenerative dystonia and cerebral palsy only around 30%. Why is that? Well, you can see because the, the damage is highly damaged in these children. Uh, they had uh, some uh, perinatal insults or hypoxia, so the damage is, uh, of the brain is quite consistent. So there is some, in any case, there has been some debate if you need to operate these uh, children, they become adults or not. So I will show you a video about that. So this is an Italian study after five years of operating uh, people with the cerebral palsy. And you see actually they had a nice improvement and uh, it looks that is uh, persistent in any case after five years of uh, uh, this kind of surgery. Just to give you an idea, what does it mean to have a cerebral palsy? This is a, a, a young man who had a severe brain injury when he was, uh, he was born, basically, with this uh, uh, problem. And uh, uh, he never walked walk in his life because he has spasticity. So he can't use his muscles, he can't use his legs. You have that he has this kind of huge movements in the in the, in the arms, and it, 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 you need to be two people to make him standing. And you see the feet, he can't walk in this way. So he has never walked in his life. He has also some cognitive uh, problem. So, and he came to see us, uh, well, not he, but uh, the, the family, asked us to do the surgery because they wanted him to walk again. Do you think that uh, this uh, Expectation is realistic. What do you think? If you have a child who has been like this for 35 years, with a lot of spasticity, spasticity doesn't mean, it means that, that um, there is a huge damage in some pathways that they control the movements. It's like after a stroke, basically. So would you like to consider this person for having surgery? Just for treating the movement, the big movement. Well, at the time we decided because uh, it was so severe, so disabled, the brain MRI was not a major contraindication for having surgery, and uh, there is evidence that these big movements with this surgery, they go away. So we decided to operate this cerebral palsy case, and uh, you will see after a few months, so you, you see that the big movements, they've gone. Hi, I'm Steve Petterbridge. I'm a director of the Stony Ireland. Um, I had DBS on the 12th of the 2nd. In January, I would have to be helped up onto the stage. I had the stonia in the neck. I had the cervical. I had the torticollis. I had the retricollis. It began with a cramp in the arm in 84. It was unknown. A dystonia, I was told it was stress, etc., etc. It was adult onset a dystonia. It was, it was diagnosed by, by a doctor, Jago, up in Bagus, Bagus Street Hospital. 
So I'm advocating anybody here from Parkinson's or anyone here from the Stone U has the fear. And I had the fear. I have bad days. I have depression. But I've had those, I would have those days anyway. And there were times, there are times you're terrified and you have dreams, but you have those anyway, no matter what ailment you have. I would go with it. Uh, I'm, I'm available to talk to anybody. Uh, that's all I have to say. I know it's a tough decision. So that's the core group. Um, you'll see many of us here today and feel free to come and talk to us about the research. But I should say also that the research um, involves strong collaborations with other researchers in na other national and international centres. I know that many of you present here have given generously of your time, you've been very supportive of our research and you've participated in our studies. Um, I hope that the brief overview I'm going to give um, will help to give you a little understanding as to where your contribution has had to play and what part um, it's, it's playing in, in helping us to understand what's going on in Estonia. I'd just like to say at this point thank you so much um, for your support, not only in this study, but in all the work that we've been doing, because really without, without your help, it's simply not possible. So thank you so much. And then we heard from Elena Moreau about the circuitry and how DBS can very effectively modulate that circuitry. However, it's relatively high risk and not something every patient needs or would opt for. So botulinum toxin really fills a, a gaping need uh, in our ability to treat dystonia and works essentially by paralyzing overactive muscles. Dystonia is not a, a muscle disease, it's not a nerve disease, and really the, the muscles that are overactive are acting out based on abnormal signals that are being sent down from the, from the brain and from the basal ganglia. So although the therapy is focused on muscle, it uses muscle as the final common pathway, if you like, of a, of a, a widespread central nervous system disorder. So botulinum toxin is an exotoxin. It is the most, often said to be the most powerful toxin in nature in what it can produce in very small quantities, produced by a bacterium of the Clostridium family. First recognized in the early 19th century in, in Württemberg, where there was a, a breakout of illness consistent with botulism that was attributed to eating uh, raw contaminated meat. That would have, would have been during the Napoleonic Wars where uh, poverty led to poor hygiene standards. Um, ultimately, the bacterium was identified and botulinum toxin can now be produced in large quantities for therapeutic measures. Uh, we'll be hearing from Professor Cassidy next, who was an ophthalmologist who first used um, botulinum toxin for treating strabismus or squint um, to reposition the eyes into a normal position. But since then, it's, it's taken on a, a, a huge range of other treatable disorders. So botulinum toxin acts, as I say, in muscle. And this is a little uh, photo micrograph of uh, a muscle. And this is the, the nerve which travels and plugs into the muscle, if you like. We're at the neuromuscular junction, which is a zone where the muscle and nerve speak. Uh, acetylcholine is released. And that's a, a little, bu little bundle of a chemical that produces muscle contraction. So what botulinum toxin does is it, it prevents the nerve talking to the muscle and thereby improving symptoms. That's putting it a little bit simplistically, but effectively what botulinum toxin can do. Muscle selection is clearly very important and the role of an experienced neurologist or movement disorders neurologist is to be able to identify patterns of muscle involvement. And as I'll talk about in a moment, most botulinum toxin treatment failures are due to uh, inappropriate selection of muscles or selecting too few muscles to inject. And it can change all the time. So the pattern of muscle involvement differs over the course of the disease, which is interesting because, again, it's not a muscle disorder. It's a, it's a brain disorder, dystonia. And so if you like, the brain or the basal ganglia have a, a faulty image of what normal posture is and are always trying to push the muscles to achieve that posture. So if uh, a patient has a you know, torticollis with a head turning to one side, the physician can weaken or paralyze those muscles that are primarily involved in producing a turn. And interestingly, a patient can come back to clinic you know, one or two years later with seemingly very little muscle activity in those prime movers, but yet still able to produce uh, a torticollis. 
So the brain, if you like, bypasses the paralysis and finds another group of muscles to produce this faulty image um, that is involved, perhaps, in dystonia. Liz is an award-winning novelist. Her, her, I'm sure some of, or many of you perhaps have read her first book, uh, Unraveling Oliver, was a, a bestseller and award-winning. And, and she told me recently that her next novel is ready to roll, about to be uh, launched, I think, this summer, you said. July. July. So uh, we wish you the best of luck with that. And, uh, but thanks very much for coming to tell us about, okay, thank about you. your experience. And thanks to uh, Dr. Hutchinson and to Maria Hickey for inviting me. Um, and I think that you know, with events like this and these fantastic photos, for example, and that's, all of these things are ways of trying to change societal views of people who have physical disability, who have you know, visible differences in the way that they move, and to try and make it easier for people to, to live their lives despite that going on. So I hope I've been able to show that, that, that this question about what causes Sony, what is Sony, is it's a complicated one, and you can think about it on lots of different levels. But the most important thing is that all of those things that all represent one thing, and that's a person who has dystonia. And uh, I think there's progress being made in trying to understand these different levels, and that's going to lead to improvements in treatment over time. Um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, we identified a total of 592 patients who had some form or other of adult onset isolated focal dystonia um, and who were alive on the 31st of December 2014. Um, it's still a, a work in progress, but um, 378 um, patients, many of whom I hope are here today, had um, consented to give their full kind of clinical information and clinical picture to us to, to categorise. Um, but as I say, this is still um, a work in progress. Um, using the data from the 2011 census, um, there, the, and, and that census, not the most recent one, unfortunately, there are over 4.5 million people in the Republic of Ireland. So 3,325,821 of these were over the age of 20 years. So this gives us um, a point prevalence or a frequency um, of focal dystonia in Ireland of 170 cases per million. So if you take 1 million people in Ireland, 170 of them will have this adult onset form of isolated focal dystonia. Um, it's twice as, uh, as we've heard from the previous speakers, it's twice as common in women as, uh, as men. So if you take 100,000 women in Ireland, um, 21 may have this uh, adult onset isolated focal dystonia, whereas only nine men um, will have it. Um, and so this is a um, bar chart um, looking at the age and um, gender distribution in five-year age groups um, of um, patients with adult onset uh, focal dystonia. Um, and very, so maybe a bit uh, stereotyped, I've given uh, pink for women and blue for men, and there's lots of pink, so it just shows the clear predominance of women. Um, and the uh, highest... Uh, the highest um, prevalence of, um, of dystonia occurred in the 65 to 69 uh, year old age group in women with um, over uh, a point prevalence of uh, over 50, 58. And, and interestingly, two studies have shown that, um, that mental health can actually be the most significant driver of poor quality of life amongst people with dystonia, which, which I found, um, you know, really um, qu quite remarkable to, to think as a, as a psychiatrist that the, um, that because when I would see patients with dystonia and I'm married to a neurologist who sees a lot of patients with dystonia and I would have thought that the, the pain and, the, and the, the physical disability would be such a driver of the suffering but that a number of studies have identified that the actual, the depression and anxiety can, can nearly trump that. A number of studies have shown that. So it reflects the importance of this whole area. Now we heard earlier, the last speaker even spoke, and, and the, the, the lady who kindly shared her experiences with us a few minutes ago uh, about the nature of stress and dystonia. And it's well recognized that f stress can worsen dystonia. A, a psychiatrist called Beck uh, was the sort of father of cognitive behavioral therapy, and he identified that there were three uh, 
sort of patterns of thinking amongst depressed people that are known as Beck's triad. They, they feel depressed about themselves, their environment around them, and their future. And so this negative feeling about yourself is well recognized in depression, but it's, it's interesting that amongst patients who are, people who are experiencing uh, depression, who have dystonia, that this negative self-esteem can be a particularly prominent feature in it. And it just suggests that it might be an area for focus on in cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, somewhat disappointingly, there are no published studies, say, for instance, of medications, of any pharmacotherapy of depression or anxiety in, in, in any type of dystonia that I'm aware of, no published ones anyway. Um, um, the, as regards then the mental health problems, another very interesting aspect to this is that it, it's, I've been speaking about how people may develop anxiety or depression in response to the pain and the social anxiety and, and, and so on around having uh, dystonia. But there may be an, another bit to the chicken and egg of it. Um, a lot of research, or well, some research recently, has been demonstrating that uh, amongst people who who have dystonia, who go on to develop anxiety and depression, that actually both of these conditions tend to develop before the dystonia does, that these conditions emerge uh, commonly in the 20s, whereas the d dystonia can often emerge years or decades later. So this, may, this is an interesting area, and it may be an area for uh, further study. Another, another interesting thing is that, generally speaking, in, um, in, in, in mental health, most of these mental health conditions, unfortunately for the women, affect women more than they do men. Um, uh, that, that typically anxiety disorders and depression are about one and a half to twice as common amongst women as they are in men. But amongst people who suffer from dystonia, mental health difficulties are equally distributed. So that, 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 that just suggests to me the, the, uh, the biology of it that, it's, that, it, that, that it, 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 it's, it's, it's in some way an inherent part of the, uh, of the, of the disease process, most likely. I, I would say to people who have dystonia or who have any disability, in fact, that you must do what you can do. Like, there are so many aids. People, I've, I've written two books, um, and I, I typed them with one hand. And people keep saying, oh, God, that's amazing. You type two books with one hand. But it's really not that amazing when you consider that Shakespeare wrote his entire works with one hand and a feather and no spell check. So really, um, it's, you know, there are things Christopher Wren designed, you know, St. Paul's Cathedral without the help of any uh, of the modern equipment that we have today. 